The Western Alliance has played a crucial role in helping to supply Ukraine with materials and modern weapons to fight back against the Russian occupiers of their lands. But without Ukrainian courage, ingenuity and stamina, those weapons would have counted for nothing. In the light of Zelensky's trip to uh, the US, today we want to discuss what Ukraine needs to win this war and how Western support for Ukraine can be sustained through the long, hard winter and through the world economic crisis that has been triggered by Russia's actions. Welcome to the Silicon Curtain podcast. Please like and subscribe if you like the content we produce. Roman Shirimieta is a professor of economics at CWRU and co-chair at UA House and a founding member at the Global Ukraine Foundation. He holds a PhD in economics from Purdue University and is a recipient of research and teaching awards, including the 2018 Smith Ascending Scholar Prize, as well as grants, including the National Science Foundation and the Max Planck Institute grants. Shirimirta was listed as a top economic thinker of Ukrainian descent by Forbes in 2015, a top rated young economist in the world, according to the ideas ranking in 2018, and recognized as the best 40 under 40 professors by poets and quants. Since the invasion of Ukraine, Sheremieta has been actively involved in delivering humanitarian aid to Ukraine and working on initiatives to rebuild Ukraine. Roman, welcome to the channel. Thank you, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd love to learn a bit more about you. In the midst of this war, you have been taking on an enormous number of initiatives, uh, both in Ukraine and to raise awareness of Ukraine in the international media. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, I cannot do otherwise, right? This is a historic moment, and I believe that right now we as a humanity uh, have to do everything that we can in order to help Ukraine win this fight for freedom and democracy. Okay. And it comes in a momentous week where Ukraine has that's been right. nominated uh you know, the, the, the leading country in the world uh, this year, uh, and yeah. also Zelensky as one of the leaders uh, of, uh, you know, freedom uh, in the world as well. So Time magazine, that famous cover. And of course, we're calling off the back of an extraordinary historic speech he made in Washington yesterday. Could you describe to me, you know, the details of that, but also your yeah. feelings at seeing him on the world stage? Oh boy, it was a special moment. I was listening uh, yesterday. I was watching his uh, talk with President Biden, his visit to the White House, and obviously when he addressed the Congress, that was a historic moment. Just uh, uh, the last time this has happened was in 1941 on December 26. So it's pretty much, you know, 81 years ago from now. And the guy that spoke at Congress, his name was Winston Churchill. You probably heard of him. Uh, and uh, it was a defining moment when the United States uh, then went on to join um, the fight against the uh, Nazis in Europe. And obviously that uh, speech of Winston Churchill ha has been historic and literally it repeated 81 years from then now. And uh, that's what uh, we witnessed yesterday. It was, um, you know, emotional moment. Uh, I was really proud to be both Ukrainian and American because uh, two great countries are the joining effort in this fight. Um, it was very, very powerful. Almost every minute there was an interruption with applause. Uh, the American government, including both Senate, Congress and the executive branch of the president, have uh, you know expressed full support of Ukraine. Uh, they have augmented the budget that they have originally have given to Ukraine uh, now to amount to almost $45 billion uh, in annual support. And they have uh, finally agreed to send a Patriot missiles to defend Ukrainian sky. Uh, so there's been a very, very important initiatives just in the past week that have literally um you know, preceded uh, sort of the Zelensky's visit. Uh, the overall reception here in the United States has been incredibly warm for the president. I think he he did uh, just, you know, he did a perfect 
um, you know, speech. He delivered the perfect speech. His English is a little bit broken, but what I loved about it, he didn't convey through the translator. He read, uh, and then it was really good. I mean, it was really good. You could uh, barely, um, you know, uh, uh, notice any mistakes. And it was so powerful because it was his voice spoken, you know, and uh, it was really, really powerful. I think this is one of those moments that we witness in history and then we will go back and we'll refer to that moment and it comes also in the time where ukraine last week was recognized as the country of the year by the the economist uh, president zelensky has appeared on you know on time magazine on the financial time on political i mean you name it pretty much every decent journal in the world has recognized that he's the man of the hour you know the man of the history and uh uh, look, uh, I know that people may have different views on him, on his personality, and that is fine. You know, uh, I honestly, as being having a dual citizenship, I, I could vote and I actually didn't vote for him as a president when it was for, up for the election because, you know, he was a comedian. He was not uh, I, I, I felt was not ready to deal with all the economic and, and other problems that Ukraine was facing. But, you know, uh, when the moment in history comes when you need to sort of uh, that defines you. Right. I mean, and and, and you can either um, take it and go with it and sort of prove everybody wrong or you can fold and, and, and just do nothing. And so he has stood up to the test. And so he definitely deserves my respect. And that's an interesting point, isn't it? Because uh, one of the propagandist um narratives coming out of russia is that he's not a democrat and he's not representative of the people and i've spoken to many many people whether it's academics journalists and so on and they'll openly say well we didn't we didn't vote for him we didn't necessarily yeah. think he was doing a good job on domestic policies That's prior right. to this invasion but almost everybody uh recognizes the extraordinary uh courage that he's taken and shown since the first days of the war and i don't know if any, everyone on the channel knows this but he visited Bakhmut, uh, yeah. I think, just prior to going to Washington. And that is an extremely uh, dangerous place. Um, and if you contrast that to the leadership in Russia, the sort of craven um, lack of courage that we see there, you wouldn't have Putin, let alone going anywhere near the front. He won't even go near his own people for yes. fear that yes. uh, they might assassinate him. So for that reason, Zelensky deserves the respect. He earned it. You know, he earned it. And hey, let's compare him to Churchill. Churchill was not the best prime minister in the peacetime. In fact, as soon as the World War II one was won, he was reelected, right? No, so he was he was not reelected, right? So he lost the, the seat as a prime minister. And uh, when he then came back as a prime minister, he was not the best to lead the country, you know, in the peacetime. But in a time of war, when there had to be this leadership and this courage to be displayed and to also be able to speak and advocate, I think he is really the man of the hour. And of course, Churchill uh, wrote a lot of his own words. He would rewrite and test his speeches over and over. <clears throat> and not that many people know these days, but he actually won you know, a Mo Nobel Prize for Literature, That's right. uh, an extraordinary author. And actually, he was born down the road from where I live in Blenheim Palace, oh, wow. which is just 20 minutes down the road. Um, but as you say, there are certain characteristics as a war leader, not necessarily the most organized, not necessarily the most strategic. But what he was able to do was to give quirky individuals a go. So when you yeah. look at uh, Bletchley Park, um, you look at some of things like the bouncing bomb and others. I mean, he didn't initiate all of these programs, but he created an atmosphere where eccentric individuals could test out their ideas. And some of those ideas uh, shaved not just months, but maybe even years off the war. Is Zelensky doing a similar thing with, say, the tech sector in Ukraine and getting making sure the best people uh, can rise to the top? Uh, you know, as any government, he's making mistakes, you know, and uh, obviously you can even see that by some of the changes that are happening, you know, from time to time, both in the, you know, in his even immediate circle, because we do see that sometimes a person is just not fit, not for the right time, not in the right place. Uh, some of the people 
uh, proven to be, um, you know, very corrupt, you know. And of course, the time of war is the time when a lot of, uh, you know, finances will be will be funneled through Ukraine. And, you know, corruption is obviously uh, rightfully so, as people say that we should be, you know, uh, worried about that. We should. I mean, we should be worried about corruption in Great Britain. We should be worried about corruption in the U.S., everywhere in the world. And, you know, but that doesn't, you know, uh, that, that doesn't preclude that the, the things that we are doing are the right things and we should be doing them. And to be honest, I actually uh, knew very well the former prime minister, Oleksiy Honcharuk, who was the first prime minister of Zelensky. I knew him personally. After he was fired by Zelensky, he came and stayed at this house for a week in Cleveland. And then, you know, so I really know Oleksiy. He is a good friend of mine. And, uh, you know, you have a person who was a prime minister in Z working for Zelensky. And he, when he was telling me things, trust me, he would tell me the things as they are. And what Oleksiy said that he would not want to work for him again. But for what reason? Because he thought that he was not a professional. Because he not necessarily knew how to make the right decisions. Uh, but what he did say, which was very reassuring, that Zelensky is not corrupt. In fact, in his own personal history, he thinks that Zelensky is, um, you know, the only probably president of Ukraine that is not tied in in any, you know, machinations and all of this, you know, all oligarchic schemes. And so uh, this was coming from the first person who was fired by Zelensky and left him. You know, so this is a, this tells me a lot that he is there for the right reasons. But he is making mistakes and he will be making mistakes because maybe for the lack of the professionalism, he was a comedian. That's true, you know, and uh, uh, he doesn't have a Ph.D. in economics or a Ph.D. in legal studies or political science. And, you know, that's his shortcoming. And we need to acknowledge. And that's why, uh, you know, uh, we are helping him by we, I mean, people and also the advisors that work with him. I'm on one of the advisory boards for Zelensky as well to make better decisions. But still, he's going to make mistakes. And uh, uh, the good thing, the really good thing, the most key positions he chose very well. And by key positions, I, for example, mean, obviously, the the uh, General Zaluzhny, the commander of the armed forces, has proven to be the most instrumental right choice made by Zelensky that really helped to you know, really outsmart Russian army by 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 a huge magnitude. Uh, also, let's say the ambassador Oleks Oksana Markarova, who I know very well in the United States, she's played instrumental role in building that bridge and helping Ukrainian weapons to get to uh, sorry American weapons to get to Ukraine. So these positions, again, I think that he chose very well, and I could have not thought of any better candidates for those positions. There are other ones that he, I think he made strategic mistakes, and some of them that he's fixing. For example, the head of the National Bank, they had to fire him just recently in a big scandal because, you know, uh, they, they found some fishy things. And so I think, again, as any democracy, that's exactly what it's all about. It's about finding better people, replacing and creating, you know, uh, new opportunities opportunities so yeah i mean i'm not i'm very pragmatic i'm not gonna paint a rosy picture i'm gonna say the things how they are well this is what the channel is all about is uh is is truth unvarnished truth so i think that's really important and this is something of course which propaganda plays on the idea that you know of course russia's corrupt but ukraine is corrupt too and you know that that's that's the 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 psychology of russian propaganda is not necessarily to convince you of their point of view but to convince you that everything is the same, everything is equally bad, and that there's no point in trying, there's no point in reforming. But I think there's a big difference, isn't there, in that corruption and nepotism are not just yeah. a bug. They are a feature of the Russian system. They are part of that vertical. They are systemic. Whereas I'm getting the impression from these interviews that corruption, where it's present in Ukraine, may not always be prosecuted, but it is not as systemic. And there is a real effort to try and root it out. Yeah, I think that the second part that you said, that there is a real effort to root it out, that's exactly where we cr we're crucially different from the from Russian Federation. 
you see, Ukraine is a democracy. It's a free country. Uh, we as a Ukrainian people, as Ukrainian citizens, you know, we're not going to stand up uh, when we see corruption. We're going to fight it. If we don't like the president, we're going to reelect the president. And uh, that's why Ukraine is chosen a very different path than the Russian Federation. And that is the path of, uh, you know, becoming a, a truly civilized, a legally abiding democracy that has the rule of law. And so that's what we want and that's what we aspire. And that's what keeps our government accountable. Uh, and for example, I mean, uh, one of the things that this war has really helped is to get rid of a lot of oligarchs. In fact, some of the biggest, you know, um, uh, corrupt people actually are fleeing Ukraine or fled Ukraine and will never come back. And that is a huge victory. So thank you, Russia, for helping us to cleanse our own, you know, country. Uh, uh, so anyway, but but the point is overall that y Ukraine is not going to, Ukrainians are not, it's not going to sit well with Ukrainians' uh, issues about corruption. Uh, we're going to stand up to for, for, uh, against those things and we're going to do everything to become better and better and better. And by the way, as I already pointed out, this government, in terms of corruption, has been the best at dealing with corruption. The best out of all the prior governments. And this is spoken to me. You know, we can look at the numbers. The numbers will tell you that. But also, this is the people that were working for the government as in the role of the prime minister, uh, you know, who basically said, look, this is really a, a right motive type of government you know they're doing the right thing they're not professionals but they're really trying to do the right thing so uh yeah so this is basically a big big difference between russia and ukraine and and, and that's why you know i think russia is threatened in part by ukraine because uh you know they see that ukraine is trying to change that you know horrible transition uh, tradition that they want to enforce the uh, the rule of law and if that were to happen, you know, uh, everybody in Russia will say, well, look at Ukraine. You know, they have been able to accomplish that. How come we cannot do it? Well, that must be because of our president. And so it directly threatens Putin and his regime. I think, yeah, <clears throat> I mean, my knowledge of um, uh, Russians is most would not look at the detail of judicial reform. Most would not look at the process that led to let's say, the improvements in, in lifestyle and wealth, but they would look at the material manifestation of those That's reforms. Right. And they would, of course, compare their own system and their own... Um, and then once you get outside Moscow and Petersburg and Ekaterinburg and the big cities, life in provincial towns, as we know, is is horrific Horrible. and the amenities Horrible. are horrific. Yeah. Um, another area, of course, is judicial reform. And... You know, I've, I've I've heard it said that one of the slowest areas uh, of improvement is actually transforming the judiciary and rooting out those people whose mindset was created during the Soviet period. You know, the the famous Homo Sovieticus. So, do you have much sort of knowledge of how those reforms are going and how crucial will they be to the rebuilding of Ukraine? Yes. Yeah, so, so this is um, a very very difficult question very difficult probably one of the most difficult ones because on the one hand we have the separation between the three branches of the government right there is a judicial there is the executive branch and then there is the legislation uh, legislative branch and the idea is that you want those to be independent and so part of that is you know we want to reform the judicial uh you know uh uh sphere but at the same time we don't want to have too much influence over that so how do you reform something that is corrupt without, you know, actually imposing uh, uh, something on them? And so this is, you know, oxymoron in a way, right? We are trying to have independent courts, and yet we are doing something to the courts, getting rid of those judges and trying to have some influence and control over the bad judges. You know, so that creates a very difficult dilemma that is constantly being battled on a legal uh, uh, field in Ukraine, discussed. And uh, this is the slowest moving reform. There is, uh, um, th th there are just issues, you know, there are issues that cannot be solved uh, in, in a short uh, period of time. It will take, it will take time. It will take, you know, maybe five, maybe 10 years to fully uh, uh, solve these issues. So for example, let's look at the United States. 
one of the ways the United States have dealt with this uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, corrupt judges is that judges are elected by people and people uh, that are, you know, the judge that overview or oversees Broadview Heights, I get to elect him. And if I find that he's in any way corrupt, our local community is going to be very quick to react and to reelect the judge, you know, and so that sort of decentralization helps us to keep the judges accountable, you know, rather than having judge appointed by somebody, you know, and then we have no say over that. So, um, but again, that took a whole legal precedent in the United States that we actually elect our judges. And the, by, by some ways, if we, you know, in Ukraine, there is a lot of debate, would that be a good system or a bad system for Ukraine? And some argue that actually in Ukraine at this stage, it would not work as well. So uh, you can just imagine how difficult these conversations are. And so the point is, though, we are, uh, this this course is happening. Reforms are being pushed, maybe slower than we, you know, we wish uh, they were more faster. Uh, but it, it is, you know, it's, it is moving. And what I really appreciate in all of this is that the West actually has a say. And I do, I do want to make sure that, you know, as um, as the West continues to provide help to Ukraine and aid, and especially when we're going to, you know, the West is going to give funds to rebuild Ukraine, I do want for those to be somewhat conditional, conditional on reforms, conditional on certain changes that need to be made. And that will keep the government of Ukraine constantly in check. And so I think that's exactly how we will help Ukraine. And me, as now speaking as Ukrainian, would be grateful for that, for that accountability. So and that's where we stand right now. As well, yeah. transparency, transparency as well, absolutely. And um, I mean, a couple of questions sort of come out of that. But one of them uh, is speaking to tech entrepreneurs as we've been doing, because, of course, one of the engines of growth and one of the key areas that's propping up the Ukrainian economy is the development of the tech sector, which has been extraordinary over the last 10 years, um, from very small beginnings, when say Crimea was invaded to now becoming, you know, a powerhouse in, in Europe and the world. Um, <clears throat> I've heard from from several sort of academics and innovators that that is going to become a crucial component in bringing transparency to government you know whether that be social security payments um to individuals that are then made by platforms that can be regulated and taking away from individual you know administrators or apparatchiks to digital voting systems to build that ground up democracy um so do you think tech is going to help drive further innovation in civil and judicial society yeah, this is a great point. I mean, th there is uh, there are two uh, points that I would like to make. First of all, the IT uh, and and uh, sphere has been uh, you know appointed as one of the three spheres priority spheres for the development of Ukraine. So uh, the other ones are the uh, obviously the defense uh, and and building the military capability. Ukraine always was good at that, but you know obviously. A lot of that uh, needs to be restored and also aerospace. And the third one is the IT. Uh, so uh, that's a strategic direction that we're going, that we have. The most resilient companies during the time of war that have not closed up were the IT companies, you know, and it's they also the mo most expert oriented. So for Ukraine, IT is clearly the, you know, sort of the golden goose that we will focus on, and especially in a time of war. It's a super, very important uh, direction. Now, the second thing that I want to point out, and that's what you are saying, is that can the IT development in itself become a catalyst of transparency and accountability and a reshaping of the government? Absolutely. Absolutely. One of the best examples is Estonia. Out of all the countries in, you know, Europe, Estonia is the most digitalized country. Uh, they have uh, made it virtually impossible to give bribes in that way because you're not going to bribe the computer. You know, if there is an algorithm, it's an algorithm that is going to determine uh, your, you know, how you are in the queue. Let's say if you are submitting uh, a, a review for a construction project and that goes automatically through the algorithm and there is no way for you to jump that algorithm. 
you know, it's just going to go the way it's going to go. So that would be a big, big uh, step forward. And already Ukraine is moving that direction. So Ukraine is one of the first countries in the world to have a digital uh, passport, right? So the platform DIA, where you actually have on your phone, you literally, uh, you know, on your phone, you have a platform that gives you your driver's license, all your, you know, your documents, your, uh, and it's it literally, when, when the, the policeman stops, you show him your phone. When, you know, when you want to show your passport, you show your phone. If you want to do any transactions, you do it with your phone. And the idea is to move, you know, to the digital voting and other things. Uh, so absolutely, I think that is exactly why even this administration had decided to move the, in that direction, because they know that if they are able to implement this, then no matter who's going to come next, you know, it will add at least a little bit more transparency and, you know, less corruption into the system. And that's a big difference, isn't it? I mean, if you go back 30 years um, in Ukraine in the 90s, and I knew people who were sort of, you know, driving through, uh, you know, large um, you know, vehicles, uh, transporting various equipment and so on. And of course, you know, this was the same in, in Russia, but they had a, the police weren't there to help people. They were almost yeah. like a private right. feudal empire That's to right. just uh, extract money from people where they could. And Gaishniki in in, in, yeah. in Russia are uh, you know like almost like a terrorist organization. It, it is such a big difference, you know, when you drive in the United States and you see a policeman. Yes, they will enforce the law, but if something happens, the policeman is the first person you want to see. If your tire pops off, if you know something happened, the policeman is going to come and help you out. They're gonna you know, will be there to protect you. And that's a very, very different mentality. And even when they stop you, sometimes what they will do, they will give you warning rather than the ticket. They'll say, I, I don't know if you notice that you're going over the speed limit. And, you know, I'm concerned about your safety. So I'm going to give you a warning, you know, uh, make sure that you slow down because it is your safety. That's why, you know, we have these speed limits. And that's a super, you know, it's a very different mentality. And I do think that we actually moving in that direction. My personal encounters as policemen in Ukraine has been quite different uh, in the past couple of years than they were, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, so I do see the difference, you know, even in one, one of the most successful reforms have been the reforms of the police in Ukraine. Another area which I'll loop back to in our previous conversation is the role of the oligarchs because it's become completely apparent hasn't it that ukraine had real oligarchs they had wealth yeah. they had influence and prior to the war the oligarchs were allowed to have media holdings they uh, and in fact most of the media environment was split up or oligarchized um and yes you'd have the news being reported but also media holdings were used in these kind of proxy wars between oligarchs now i know zelensky has changed that they've consolidated the media there's now a law that prevents oligarchs from actually holding majority stakes in these media outlets and using them as weapons and i'd like to unpack that a little bit but it's also in sharp contrast with the impression that I think we had in the West that, that Russia was an oligarchical culture. And it's yeah. shown that the oligarchs there, actually, their wealth is least. They don't have real power. And if they so much as squeak against the government, you know, either their wealth is taken away from them, as happened with Khodorkovsky, or they have some unfortunate accident involving a window or stairs. Yeah, I mean, if you uh, notice in the past uh, half a year, that has been just an... Uh, an unusual uh, amount of accidents that have happened to the Russian, you know, oligarchs and CEOs of uh, big companies, literally within the last half a year. And they're happening every other week, which is, you know, I don't know who's doing that, but clearly, you know, uh, there is th that problem uh, in Russia. But if you actually take 0.01% of population, Russia has the biggest concentration of wealth in 0.01% of population in the world, by far, in the world. There's, you know, no, not Venezuela, not like, you know, United States, not Ukraine. No, nobody comes close if you take 0.01%. They pretty much 
you know that that just that signifies the level of uh, uh, oligarchy in in Russia. Uh, but in Ukraine, obviously, that has um, uh, that has been uh, uh, we have been dealing with it. You know the way, obviously. Uh, uh, trying first through the legal means you know the existing uh, legal means and now the russia uh, the russia has helped well the russian aggression has helped to move it forward and faster so for example people like medvedchuk have disappeared forever from ukrainian you know uh, um, uh, market from ukraine kolomoisky and others and even akhmetov who is uh, you know who has been trying to be more western oriented uh, oligarch and to work more like a you know true ceo and uh, and and even there because of these uh, legal uh, restrictions that ukraine has imposed like you know he gave a, uh, uh, up his ownership of one of the biggest uh, ukrainian media companies as you pointed out so uh, now <laughs> there is a, obviously a struggle you know when people see the president and the government is going after media, you know, they obviously, well, that's intrinsic in, in the free speech. And now then you have a problem that look what Zelensky is doing, you know, now he's acting like a dictator because he's trying, you know, to mess up with media. And then that's, that's the problem that we face, right? When you are to make these radical reforms and changes, you know, it, it will appear as if you're doing something, you know, non-democratic, but, uh, again, uh, when somebody takes you and puts you in the prison, is that a democratic thing to do? You know, probably not, you know, because you but the, then uh, the, the prison is there for a reason, because uh, you have violated a certain laws. And so that that's basically the dilemma that is right now uh, Ukraine is facing. But we are definitely seeing a big changes uh, in the, the structure of oligarchy in Ukraine. And it's in a positive way. And has the war accelerated these reforms? Because I imagine Absolutely. breaking breaking these monopolies would not have yeah. been easy in peacetime. Yeah. And you can see as well that those who are being sort of squeezed by the reforms could easily side with Russian propagandists. They could use that to yeah. conflate, you know, their arguments. Um, that becomes far more difficult at the moment, doesn't it? Yeah, so uh, what I do hope, I mean, it's moving in the right direction. First of all, you know, the war sort of equalizes everyone, right? And so uh, the wealth that is being destroyed, usually the oligarchs get hammered the most because Russia went after factories, they went after the infrastructure, they went after the power grid, which is controlled by, you know, one of the oligarchs in Ukraine. And so they have really been hit hard by uh, by by Russia. Now, what I do hope is that at the level of the reconstruction, when we start and continue, well, continue uh, rebuilding Ukraine, that that will be one of the preconditions of rebuilding Ukraine. What I hope, for example, uh, is that we will have a more decentralized power grid uh, in Ukraine that, uh, you know, Every region, every uh, sort of uh, every city will have access to their own power grid, which will be developed by their businessmen. And then this way we will create a competition for uh, supply of electricity, uh, you know, and that, that's something that I hope that when uh, the Western countries are going to and Western companies are going to come along and they see that Ukrainian market is very ripe, right? Because there's going to be a lot of need to rebuild electrical stations. And uh, I hope that this is the way that we're going to create the competition. So in that way, even during the rebuilding phase, I do believe that we have an opportunity uh, to create a more competitive market and get rid of uh, this uh, monopolistic uh, oligarchical uh, dependency in Ukraine. And, you know, oligarchy is not just a problem in Ukraine. I mean, we, we sure. see in the UK and the US a descent uh, into semi-oligarchical -olig status. And the US has a real problem, I think, because of the uh, huge injection of money that goes into the uh, political system. Uh, that That's less the case in the UK. But nonetheless, um, you know, there are still sort of issues there. One of the biggest 
barriers to preventing that uh, slide into oligarchy is, of course, the power of SMEs, the rule of law and so on. And it's interesting, isn't it? In Russia, up until 2012, there were liberal economists in the government. Um, Putin understands nothing about the economy. I and mean, we know that now. He he has no interest and no understanding of it whatsoever. But there were people around him that... that uh, were able to, uh, to 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 liberalize the economy to an extent, but judicial reforms, corruption, nepotism, the role of apparatchiks, you know, as soon as you have a successful business, it gets stolen from you. So right. there was the able to develop, you know, Russia in the large urban centers did develop some kind of middle class economy, but there's a real finite cap on it. Um, and seemed to accelerate faster than Ukraine did, at least sort of 20 years ago, 15, 15 or 10, 15 years ago. Do you think, however, Ukraine is going to accelerate with, you know, the new judicial oh, reforms and, and the growth of SMEs and tech? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the tech industry is just a very good example of that, right? That, uh, you know, it, it enabled the creation of these startups that can pretty quickly become very wealthy, you know, if they have a good idea and uh, access to the international market, you know, and so we have a lot of a lot of uh, multimillionaires that you know uh, are young guys that just were able to to use the competitive market in order to uh, you know create products and 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 do something that's very special. So absolutely, I think that we already way ahead of uh, Russia in that direction. The the small businesses, the medium sized businesses, have been really prospering in Ukraine the 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 fact that our oligarchs are sort of you know diminished in value and have uh, their importance have decreased is going to further push this the fact that there will be a rebuilding of ukraine and new players are going to be entering the market for the years to come is going to be yet another factor to that so uh, i really hope that there will be more foreign direct investments and more companies that maybe left russia there's more than a thousand of the big companies that have left russia Maybe they will consider coming to Ukraine and actually, you know, uh, building their business there. Because we know that uh, once you have uh, uh, big international companies, then, of course, those companies are definitely, you know, more law abiding. They, uh, you know, they pay taxes. They, uh, uh, you know, they, they work within the legal framework of the country. And so that will be yet another reason why. Uh, I believe Ukraine is going to be able to uh, get into a more competitive and true market economy much faster, much faster than Russia. And we know what happened in Russia when companies and entrepreneurs tried to introduce these transparency standards. Um, Khodorkovsky, I'm sure, wasn't perfect. Yeah. But one yeah. of the reasons, apart from criticizing Putin, that his empire was was deconstructed and taken away from him was that he did try to adhere to some of the sort of Western, more transparent accounting structures. And then there's the case of uh, Bill Browder and Hermitage Capital, uh, one of the largest foreign investment pools. It seems that, that, that anyone who wants to adhere to those standards in Russia, their business is dead, whereas yeah. Ukraine is moving towards a, a more transparent, you know, um, internationally recognized sort of framework uh, in terms of doing business. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, uh, th th that is, um, you know, th that is a distinct feature, you know, uh, that the differentiate uh, differentiates Ukraine and and Russia. Uh, you know that the fact that when Ukrainian uh, small business speaks up, it you know it doesn't get killed. You know, it, that, at least that 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 age has passed for Ukraine a long time ago. And obviously, the reforms that are happening and will be happening, they will uh, further uh, uh, make it more liberal economy. Um, and, uh, you know, when I when I talk to my friends who run businesses in Ukraine, that's a very common, you know, um, sense that, you know, it is easier to do business in Ukraine these days as long as you have access to capital which, you know, this is something that we will need to uh, work together to provide Ukrainian companies with, uh, uh, e e you know, relatively ease of access to venture capital, to loans and things like that. But absolutely, this is, I think, this is a no-brainer. And by the way, one of the things that I wanted to highlight is that probably Ukraine 
in the next coming 10 years will be the best country in terms of the investment. You know, if you think about you know, the GDP growth, if you think about the opportunity to uh, become a, a player on the market, I think that uh, any any firm that is looking for uh, making good profit, building good business, uh, should be looking into Ukraine as a very good venture. And of course, the rebuilding funds are going to be massive, and massive. and hopefully. Yeah. Billions of that will come from the money that's been frozen from Russian central bank Absolutely. assets. Absolutely. So Absolutely. On. Yeah. Uh, and if it's done in a in a planned way, in an enlightened way, and we know that Ukraine is also becoming a cultural powerhouse, which until very recently the whole world was unaware of. Um yeah. now the strength and, and vibrancy of Ukrainian literature, the visual arts, you know, costume, dress, music, dance, all of these are coming to the fore of world attention. Absolutely. Absolutely. Today, you know, um, it, it is, you know, I always was proud that I'm Ukrainian, you know, that I was born in Ukraine. But today, you know, it's, it's a specially proud moment because, you know, everybody knows about Ukraine. It became a brand and Ukraine should be using this as an opportunity to uh, to build to to build on that brand while there's still this momentum. Right. I mean, one of the things that we were uh, sending with our team from American University Kiev in D.C. the other day. And uh, we were talking, uh, we were in the Georgian restaurant. And we were saying like, look, in America, there's actually quite a lot of Georgian restaurants and the Georgian cuisine is kind of known. And Georgia is way smaller than Ukraine. And now, you know, this is the time, this is the opportunity to use that brand and to build, you know, uh, restaurants in America is to, you know, bring that awareness and, and uh um, you use that, you know, uh, to to the advantage. Uh, and I do believe that Ukraine is going to play a very significant role in the, in the defense sector in the many, many decades to come. They're going to have uh, battle tested, you know, commanders that will uh, be very good uh, uh, at training other, you know, soldiers. And so and also in terms of the operating of the equipment and things like that. So absolutely. Ukraine is a brand. And it will, uh, you know, and we, it should be used strategically because it is one of the things that, you know, Ukrainians have accomplished by their bravery. And I think this is something that not that many people are aware of in the West, that actually the high tech weaponry and the sort of avionics and the airline industry um, was actually, you know, Ukraine was at the forefront of that in the Soviet Union. So it isn't that this has emerged from nowhere. This is following on from a, a strong tradition, isn't it, of engineering? That, that, that's correct. I mean, uh, there was a couple quite a few years ago when SpaceX was in development. Elon Musk uh, was asked a question, uh, you know, which uh, uh, engines for the rockets he likes the most. And obviously his first response was, well, of course, SpaceX, my own engines are the best. And then he said, but the second best are Ukrainian engines. You know, so that that speaks volume, you know, that uh, Ukraine does have that heritage and they do have a comparative advantage in terms of the scientists and the science that has been done in Ukraine. Um, you know, uh, Ukraine has one of the highest um, literacy and educational rates in Europe and in the world uh, per capita. So people are very well educated. People uh, uh have the tradition of this technical education of developing, you know, uh, a high tech machinery. And as you pointed out during the Soviet Union, that was the brains of the operations. In fact, a lot of uh, uh, nuclear, uh, like most of the maintenance of the Russian rockets and nuclear po uh, power came from Ukrainians, you know. And so now, of course, Russia understands that they need to develop their own strength because Ukrainians are not going to be servicing those things. But uh, that's absolutely right. And that's a strength that we should be uh, utilizing. Well, my last question uh, is is really leads on from that. And what is the next 10 years going to look like as Ukraine comes more into the orbit of the European Union, NATO, Western alliances, defensive structure, but also integrates much closely, more closely with the economy? I mean, what does that mean on an economic level, uh, on a military level? 
And of course, what does that mean for, well, not just Ukrainians in terms of their opportunities, what does that mean in terms of Europe, you know, yeah. gaining this, uh, as it were, new new territory, new allies and new sort of strength. And I would say a, a shot in the arm of innovation and vibrancy, which perhaps Europe might might be lacking a little bit. No, absolutely. That's how I see it. And that's the strength of both European uh, uh, countries and Ukraine. And I think that Ukraine has always been a part of Europe. It's just because of the Soviet Union that, that Ukraine has been you know, uh, detached uh, uh, from Europe, but you no know, people always had a very different mentality that uh, that that the Russians and something that Russians seem not to recognize that why are Ukrainians so different? I mean, we are different. We are different people. We uh, come more from European uh, tradition rather than the uh, you know uh, than than the Muscovian tradition, and so. Uh, what the next 10 years are going to 10 years are going to look like well first of all as you pointed out we as the west we're going to be uh putting a lot of uh funds in ukraine uh we will uh we will share in the burden with ukraine we will confiscate a lot of russian assets and use them for ukrainian advantage our companies venture capitalists and uh, Big funds will also want to go into Ukraine because it's going to be profitable. For the next 10 years, Ukraine is going to be on an accelerator GDP growth. And so after the victory, after the war, uh, you know, it's going to be a very lucrative uh, business. There's going to be a lot of innovation. Ukrainians themselves are going to be very motivated, you know, as uh, as I mean, we, we have these precedents with uh, Germany after the World War II, with uh, Japan. How quickly those countries recovered and and built up on the strength of their countries with the help of the West, they were able to become the powerhouses of the world. And I do believe that that's exactly uh, will will happen in Ukraine. Ukraine have all the predispositions, all the right elements. They just need some help, and we will provide as the West will provide that help. Um, now, in terms of um, defense, obviously, as I said, there is going to be three. Uh, uh, emphasis in Ukrainian uh, development of economy. One of that is going to be the defense sector. It's always going to be there because Russia is not going to disappear. Even if it were to, you know, uh, disintegrate, there's always going to be a threat. And Ukraine is positioned very strategically, uh, geographically, as to be, you know, a, a buffer between Europe and Russia. And also, uh, uh, you know, there's going to be a tremendous experience from the battles, there's going to be tremendous experience from operating the weapons. And Ukraine has been really good at developing weapons as well. Uh, a lot of weapons that are used today against Russia are developed by Ukrainians. And Ukraine would have been, you know, doing even much more having Russians destroyed some of these factories. Uh, but that being said, you know, even today, uh, Ukraine is developing, you know, drones, they are developing uh, uh the, the the their uh, missiles and things like that uh and so ukraine will help the rest of the world to build a more secure defense uh so that's going to be militarily i think um uh, economically of course it will be a more attractive place for economic growth just because uh that, that that's uh that's where the finances are going to flow for some period of time disproportionately which will accelerate GDP growth and, and the potential uh, to start new companies. Uh, I already, you know, one of the initiatives that I'm involved in is called this Global Ukraine Foundation, which we where we literally reach out to the uh, wealthy, uh, uh, you know, owners and CEOs and uh, uh, people that are involved in big, big companies with the large capital uh, the people that we already imported, uh, you know, their capital is over uh, or the, the amount of money that they manage is over 50 billion dollars. And these people already preparing their funds to invest in Ukraine uh, because it's a good investment. And so uh, that will be, you know, uh, something that will play a very, very important role. Now, as far as the integration of Ukraine in Europe, I think it's going to be relatively smooth. There will be a lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, 
a lot of things that we will need to work out in terms of the um, aligning our legal systems, aligning our export import uh, agreements. There will be a lot of uh, things that we'll need to. Also, the immigration is going to be a big issue because, um, you know, Ukraine will want to attract all the people that have left Ukraine, you know, but at the same time, uh, people are people and some will be very happy coming back to Ukraine and being part of the rebuilding process. Others will say, look, you know, why not stick with UK? It's already developed. It's already has, you know, um, a, a good economy. It has a wonderful uh, lifestyle. So that's something that, you know, we'll also need to figure out. But we will figure out, you know, we as civilized world have lear learned how to deal with these issues in a civilized manner. And so, you know, I have a really good feeling for Europe and for Ukraine. I don't have that feeling for Russia, but that's a different story. Yeah, I suspect uh, Russians I've spoken to in this podcast series, none of them have said they're going back. In fact, some of them kind of corrected my overly optimistic assumption and they straight out said they won't be returning. They've been sort of deceived, threatened, everything they've worked for, stolen from them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you can criticize the uh, lack of political involvement that many Russians have, but nonetheless, I don't think they have that sense of of uh, responsibility or ownership or being part of the society that they fled from. And unlike Ukrainians, uh, whether they're part of the diaspora or not, they feel that they're part of a vibrant culture, which they want to you know, keep those connections to. Well, Roman, I have yes. to say, this has been one of the most optimistic interviews I've done out of the series. Um, Thank you, Jonathan. And it's great to look forward, especially with this sort of economic confidence. And it might seem at these depths of the winter war and the terrible losses that are happening, nonetheless, it's, it's good to look forward and know that people are actually fighting for something which is meaningful and, 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 and valuable. Yes, yes. Thank you, Jonathan, for having me. And thank you, all the listeners and those who support Ukraine. Um, you know, I just want to call everyone to stand with Ukraine, to support Ukraine, uh, to uh, if you can get engaged in any way, whether it's, you know, social media or you can actually physically do something for Ukraine, donations work, you know, everything. And just uh, standing with Ukrainian people, it's uh, we're at the very a pivotal moment in the history and you know it's good to be on the right side of the history and thank you jonathan for uh bringing me on your show thank you and uh, slava ukraine